ಸ್ಥಾಪಕಾಯ ಸ್ಥಾಪಕಾಯ ಅವತಾರವರಿಷ್ಠಾ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ನಿರಂಜನ ನಿತ್ಯಮನಂತರೂಪ ಭಕ್ತಾನುಕಂಪಾದೃತವಿಗ್ರಹ ವೈ ನಿರಂಜನ ನಿತ್ಯಮನಂತರೂಪ ಭಕ್ತಾನುಕಂಪಾದೃತವಿಗ್ರಹ ವೈ ಈಶಾವತಾರ ಪರಮೇಶಮೇಢ್ಯ ತಂ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಶಿರಸಾನಮಿ let us bow down to shri ram krishna the embodiment of all religions the supreme god incarnate who is adored by all pure eternal infinite by nature out of his infinite grace on the devotees the divine supreme has assumed a human form in the form of shri ramakrishna let us bow down to him let us try to dwell upon the personality shri ramakrishna let us offer our salutations to shri ramakrishna the embodiment of all religions the supreme god incarnate let us pray to him to lead us from the unreal to the real to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge to lead us from death to immortality today's topic i have chosen how to win god's grace of course lord krishna has said very clearly in the bhagavad gita become my devotee worship me bow down to me so lord krishna has prescribed steps how to win god's grace the grace of god descends upon you when you discover your total and utter helplessness it dip it descends upon you like a cool shower when god chooses to bless you he gives you the full measure your effort is very tiny of course your first effort should be there god appreciates our effort but we find this effort is too insignificant compared to lord's abundant grace that's why when we have the vision of god you will be overwhelmed you feel you have got abundant grace of god and you shed tears of joy 
when you go to the ocean of god you can take as much water as you want it all depends upon the vessel you take to the ocean that means it depends upon how pure you are one has to be pure that means one has to be free from all uh, worldly nature jealousy hatred anger and so on enlightenment cannot come as a result of evolution awakening is not a result of evolution awakening is a waking up this is saying we are waking up from the so called waking state we are all in ignorance only when we are blessed with the knowledge of the reality then it is really said we are awakened grace will come only when you make an effort and that effort becomes surrender if you sit idle without doing anything become lazy you can't expect god's grace so the effort results in your surrendering to the divine that means offer that effort to the lord making that effort offering those efforts at the feet of the lord and waiting for his grace and that is what is called surrender you have to wait you can't be impatient so there is a sanskrit word pratiksha there's a story told by shri ramkrishna in the gospel some vekand also has said this story once narad was wandering he came across two hermits who were meditating upon god when he was come near the one of the hermits he was absorbed in so much of austerity until grew over him so that ascetic came to know that devarshi is coming on the way so he wanted to ask him whether he could give the information about when he would realize god when would he realize god narad said all right i will i am going to the abode of the lord and i will get the necessary information and come back to you to report so then he approached the second hermit who was also meditating deeply he also was very anxious to know about the result of his tapas and narada agreed well anyway i am going to the abode of the lord so i shall let you know so after some time narada again came back on the same way and the hermit on whom the ant hill grown was very anxious to know about the result so when he came near him the ascetic asked him very anxiously what did lord say narad said well he said you will have to take few more births at least four births you have to take on hearing this he was disheartened what i have been 
doing tapas for such a long time, fasting, doing all kinds of festivities, still God wants me to have four more births. So he was in a very depressed mood. Then he went to the second hermit. So he was also very anxious to know. Then the Narada said, Look, do you see there the tamarind tree? Yes. How many leaves are there? Oh, you can't count the leaves. You will have to take so many births before you can actually realize God. And hearing this, he was not dejected. On the other hand, he jumped in joy. Well, God has given assurance that after so many births, he will definitely give his vision. He was sincere in his uh, belief. And immediately heard the divine voice. Well, I am pleased with your sincerity. Right now you will have the vision. So God showed his grace to him. That means the second one was ready to wait as long as God wants him. That is called Pratiksha. The other one was impatient. He didn't have that kind of tolerance, patience. God definitely reveals himself once we reach a state of perfection. Once our mind is completely free from all blemishes, impurities, worldliness. And the mind is totally free from all, all sorts of desires bothering. So when the mind is focused on the realization of the truth, then God reveals. So, we must wait for His grace. Keep doing spiritual practice, maintain the purity level, keep waiting. That is what is called surrender. Saranagati. Lord Krishna also mentions Sharanagati in Bhagavad Gita. Faith in oneself and faith in the Guru gives you enormous energy. The point is people are very feeble, weak-minded. They are not very serious about spiritual practice but simply they want the result. That cannot happen. Your effort has to be adequate and appropriate. You should have no time to spare for other things. How much time we waste in useless things. And how many times we impure our mind by indulging all sorts of things, actions. So one has to be really careful. So your effort has to be adequate and appropriate. Effort under the guidance of a teacher under the guidance of your own conscience or under the guidance of a holy scripture. Guidance of a holy scripture. There's a way of understanding the scripture. If you are not properly trained in your mind, there's chance of your becoming fanatic. No. You should have no trace of fanaticism in your spiritual approach. 
So you must have the capacity to understand the scriptures in a proper spirit. And apply the ideas in your actual life. Whatever the efforts you make, surrender everything at the feet of the Lord. Through those efforts and through the surrendering of those efforts, the floodgates will be opened. So, total surrender means you must surrender your ego, ahankar, the most stumbling block on our spiritual path is this ego. It is too terrible even to think of it. And you will feel how in a dubious way the ego functions. It comes upon anybody, particularly those who are practicing spirituality must be more careful than the so-called worldly people. Worldly people is very natural to be egoistic. There is nothing to be proud of. Quite natural. But a spiritual person, if he is egoistic, it is obnoxious, it is intolerable. That only shows one has to take serious steps to get rid of this ego. The more you practice spiritual sadhana, the more humble you should become. Humble in the real sense, not showy humbleness. Humble in letter and spirit. So, when you are able to surrender your ego, when you place your ego at the lotus feet of the Lord, whom you are worshipping, then that is the way to win God's grace. And as a result of that grace, you can wipe off all the impact of your past previous births and karmas. So many actions we do knowingly and unknowingly. Every action results in reaction. And whatever we do, we do knowingly or unknowingly, action will have its reaction. That's the law of nature. And everyone is bound by it. <clears throat> so, descent of grace is the culmination of Bhakti Yoga. If God is pleased with your devotion, He immediately gives you what you want. We can have the example of Swami Vivekananda. How he went to Mother Kali to pray to the Divine Mother to remove poverty and distress and sufferings in his uh, home, since his father, father had passed away. And the whole burden of taking care of the home fell upon Swami Vivekananda. He came to seek the help of Sri Ramakrishna. He thought Sri Ramakrishna could pray to, Holy, to Divine Mother on his behalf because Sri Ramakrishna had seen Divine Mother. And Swami Vivekananda knew that Sri Ramakrishna did communicate with Mother. So why not Sri Ramakrishna pray for Him? So when Vivekananda approached Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna said, Very good. Why don't you pray yourself? Why do you want proxy? Can you not go and pray to the Divine Mother yourself? That had tremendous effect on Vivekananda's mind. Yes. Why not I pray? Then he went to mother. Because his mind was totally pure. 
mother could not but reveal in fact it is said it is because of the abundant grace of shri ram krishna swami vivekananda could see divine mother face to face and mother himself began to ask the question well my child what really you want by seeing that benign face of the mother his already pure mind was totally absorbed and he was completely unaware of external things and his mind was desiring nothing such a perfect state he was he just asked mother what should i ask of you what should i pray if you are really granting me please grant me jnana bhakti viveka vairagya knowledge devotion discriminate to understand the real what is unreal and dispassion please grant me those things very good you will have all those mother immediately blessed and shri ramakrishna sent him two three times to go and pray for removing sufferings in the home he could not pray that way so that is the effect of complete purity in the mind and he was totally free from the dangerous ego there are so many instances about how lord bestowed his grace on the devotees number of them are there ajamil akrur ambarish arjun bhishma dhruva draupadi and so on so there are two ways of how one may win god's grace two ways one view is that you have to cleave to god as a baby monkey clings to its mother it's called markata nyaya monkey theory considers human effort as essential in obtaining freedom just as a young monkey has to exert itself and cling to its mother while being carried to its destination the second view is that you don't have to make any positive effort just surrender yourself to god as a baby cat surrenders to its mother and relaxes this one is called as marjaranya the cat theory which emphasizes prapatti complete resignation to god's will as the most effective means of freedom so one has to be clear about what method he is approaching to win god's grace Lord Krishna also has given prescription to win God's grace in Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita has got everything. Hold on to Gita, your life will be transformed. But you have to apply the ideas contained in the Gita. So, till the last breath of your life, you must be practicing spirituality not that for some years i will do after second be whatever i want to no 
and the last breath of your life you should be practicing with that most sincerity and diligence spirituality so lord krishna says it is uh, called as charma shloka most important in the bhagavad gita sarva dharman parityajya mamekam sharanam vraja ahantva sarva papebhyo mokshishyami mashuchaha in what emphatic way lord krishna shows here renounce everything seek me alone your protection i take care of i'll free you from all sins when the lord says shed your dharma sarva dharma an pratyajya he does not mean abandon your action your duties you have to do certainly but they must be done in a spirit of detachment you are doing the duty for duty's sake you are doing your duties as offerings to god as a worship of god in fact while you are doing your duties you must surrender the doership itself to god then god by his grace will convert all your actions to dharmic ones they pave the way for your spiritual unfoldment once this kind of surrender is done to the lord to the extent of merging one's individuality with the lord thereafter one becomes an instrument in the hands of god and nothing more he feels immensely blessed that he has become a worthy instrument of god to all external appearances such a devotee may appear to behave like ordinary people discharging all his duties scrupulously according to his station in life but within himself the devotee will not be conscious of doing anything of his own accord or for his own sake often he may be seen to override accepted codes of conduct or social custom or propriety but also often he may be so immersed in the bliss of his god experience that he appears dead to his surroundings it is this kind of self effacement that is the culmination of a complete surrender to god and such surrender has to be done by one's own free will man has a free will to obey or disobey god the so called fatalist view in religion is only a fragmentary part of hinduism because of the vasanas that one brings along with his birth one is born in a particular environment and this facet of one's personality mistakenly branded as fate reflects mainly in one's tendencies fate does not influence anything except the tendencies everything else is one's own making one has the total free will to surrender to god or not great souls the pious and the devout who possess a divine nature they know him as a prime cause of all creation they know him as the imperishable as permeating everything just as air pervades all space they know him as agent provocator for even the swing of a little leaf they constantly chant his names and glories and strive to attain his grace to worshiping him with single minded 
devotion. They constantly think of him and nothing else and worship him for the sake of worship. To such people who are ever immersed in his thought, God promises that he will take care of their security and well-being. Yogakshemam vahamyaham He goes on further to promise, Whosoever offers to me with love a leaf, a flower, a fruit or even water, I delightfully partake of the article offered by such a disinterested devotee of purified intellect. Famous verse in Bhagavad Gita chapter 9 Patram Pushpam Phalam Toyam Yome Bhaktya Prayachati Tadaham Bhakti Uparhatam Asnami Prayatatmanaha So, what Sri Krishna is pointing out here is sincerity. Are you sincere? If you are sincere, whatever you do is accepted by God. And you become qualified to receive God's grace. Please note that all the things Lord Krishna has listed about are products of nature and nature alone. Man doesn't have to strain himself to get them. God doesn't calculate the value of the things you offer him. He only calculates the feeling that prompted your offering. Feeling. This is the art of spiritual love. Bhakti means love. Bhakti aparyachati. We have only to purify the feeling behind the act in order to win God's grace. Again Lord Krishna says in the Gita, Yat karoshi yadashnasi Yat juhoshi dadasi yat Yat tapasya kaunteya Tat kurushva madarpanam Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer as oblations to the sacred fire, whatever you bestow as a gift, whatever you do by way of penance, offer everything to me. And Sri Krishna is showing the method, the way to reach him. This is the science of spiritual love. Everything is an offering or dedication to him. These two concepts, the art and the science of spiritual love, they have been emphasized in our scriptures very clearly. Lord Krishna gives so much assurance and hope to everyone in this universe, even if he is a worse sinner. Apichet sudurachāro bhajate ma mananya bhāk sadhureva samantavya samyag vyavasato hisaha Even with the vilest sinner worships him with exclusive devotion in this spirit he should be considered noble because he has taken the first step. He has realized what blunders he had committed and now he has taken right step of worshipping the Lord. And to those who have taken towards the Lord even a single step, the Lord promises to take several steps towards them so that they can speedily become dharmatma. The simple meaning of this word dharmatma is a virtuous soul. But the two words which constitute it 
have deep connotations. To such a devotee, the Lord assures us, my devotee never perishes. Kshipram bhavati dharmatma shashvachantim nigachati kaunte yapatijani hi name bhakta pranashyati. So what more assurance we want? Just to be a devotee and he takes care of everything. A question may be raised. We see many devotees, some of them really true devotees in every sense of the word. They suffer either hunger or poverty or disease or failure in their endeavors. How can this be explained? The elementary answer is God tests them to gauge the intensity of their belief and devotion. Pariksha. Everyone has to pass through the fire of test. You can't simply get a degree without passing semesters properly, without taking proper credits. So Pariksha. But how long does God have to test? Very often one finds that there is no end to the suffering one undergoes in spite of one's devotion. Our teachers explain this with the help of several analogies. One is that of driving a nail into a wall. What does he do? After hitting the head of the nail a few times, one shakes it and checks whether it can be pulled out from the wall. And one does this several times, alternatively hitting and driving the nail into the wall and checking by shaking. This process of intervening by periodical trials of strength goes on in the life of devotee. This is part of the science of spiritual love. The more one survives each trial, the more intense one's faith becomes. So, when God says, my devotee never perishes, he means ultimately. How long is ultimately is the question. It depends on the accumulation of one's own purva karma, karma of all one's past lives. If the bank balance of karma is too much on the negative side, the only way to wipe out the deficit is to suffer it. It is very hard for the people to grasp this idea. Anyway, that is the truth. You are only begging the question. By referring to an unknown past and thus getting away from the real issue. Why do devotees suffer? Has been answered in another way. The elementary answer is that God tests them to gauge the intensity of their belief and devotion. The answer, this answer is indeed given by many exponents of Hinduism and is also mentioned in some contexts in the scriptures, in Puranas. The elementary answer only underestimates the omniscience of God. He has no necessity to test us, ordinary mortals. He clearly knows that we will fall in such tests. But then this theory of God testing his devotees is certainly true in the case of confirmed intense devotees of the Lord. In such cases, he tests them just to show to the rest of the world how intense and effective that devotion is 
and how far a devotee's faith can carry him he knows that they won't fail his test in our ordinary cases the theory that god tests us is not acceptable we suffer because of our karma and we have to suffer it hinduism is very clear on this point in fact even in the case of leading devotees they could not avoid the suffering that they had to endure but their lives show how when the lord's grace descended on them the most intense suffering could be either transformed into intense delight or more often than not god's grace instead of wiping out their suffering provided an insulation of faith which enabled them to be oblivious of that suffering underneath if god's grace is what ultimately decides what is going to happen to me why does he not give me or grant me that bhakti which i seem to lack and need yes god grants you that bhakti but you have to receive it the rain may pour but if a vessel is upside down no water will collect in it your mind is free by your own free will you have to decide to receive what god is ready to give you by your own volition you have to decide to trust in god and surrender to him if by supplanting your will god has to give you what you need then there need be no creation no existence of the universe this is the mystery of god's leela creation is a kind of play where god allows beings to have the feeling of separateness from him and then waits and waits until the beings that have emerged from him come back to him if they don't want to come back to him he allows them to go their own way and take their own time to discover that this is the want which will finally rid them of all their wants the agony of god in this great cycle of creation is that beings do not want to get out of this cycle so sometimes he gives them all the petty things they want so that in due time they would want what he wants to give them all our temples gods and goddesses and the numerous ways by which we can propitiate the divine in these places of worship as well as the uncountable methods by which we may offer our private prayers all of them have that one objective that we should ultimately want to go back to where we came from that is merge in god and his glory to understand the glory of divinity one has to tune one's mind to take time off from one's constant activity in the mundane world to see darkness one must have darkness to understand intelligence the right way you have to be intelligent to be conscious you must have consciousness so also to become divine you must live in the memory of the divine this is saying a favorite of shri ramakrishna just as a dancing girl fixes her attention on the water pot she bears on her head even when she is dancing to various tunes so also the true devotee does not give up his attention to the blissful feet of the supreme lord even when he attends to his many and varied concerns so fix your mind on him and make obeisance to him by serving him and humanity at large unite yourself to him and to his cause entirely depend on him and surrender to him even your feelings of mine and thine 
then says bhakti yoga you shall win his grace so you must win god's love you all praise god but it is far more important that god praises you you declare your love for god but you have to find out if god has declared his love for you you believe that god is yours but has god told you that you are his suppose you send a registered letter to someone you will gain full satisfaction only after you receive an acknowledgement from the addressee that the letter has been received and read declaring your love for god and declaring that god is great can be compared to sending a registered letter but that alone will not satisfy you you experience the deepest contentment only when you get the positive acknowledgement from god that you have his love and that he considers you great also it is only when he says you are my very own you are most dear to me that you attain total fulfillment arjun got such an assurance from the lord after he said to lord krishna oh lord you are my all i am yours i am yours i surrender everything to you previously arjun had a number of desires but when he surrendered fully to the lord he renounced all his wants and desires then he earned the declaration from the lord dear one you are mine to gain this result you have to engage yourself in spiritual practice the hope and fruit of all spiritual practice is to get this declaration from the lord that you are his this becomes your greatest treasure the consummation of your life even if you are highly educated even if you occupy a very high position in life even if you are very wealthy whatever be your station in life when you go abroad you must have a passport to travel in a foreign land a person may say i am highly educated all these things may be personal attainments and accomplishments but if you want to go to another country there is a particular procedure that you must follow this procedure cannot be different for educated people and for uneducated people for wealthy ones and poor ones even in such a small thing as going somewhere by bus or train or plane no one will care to know your position and accomplishments as long as you have ticket with you no one will ask you if you are a wealthy person or an educated one and what position you are holding and so on they will be satisfied to know that you have a ticket and that they, they will take you to your destination if you do not have the ticket you will be left behind no matter what your credentials are in the same way if you want to gain entry into the kingdom of liberation you need to have the grace of god that is required for entry the grace of god is your passport but even a passport is not enough if you merely have a passport then there may still be some objections and problems you should also have a visa that gives you the right to enter your place of destination in addition to the grace of god you must also have the merit of your spiritual efforts and yearnings that is visa the giver may be ready to give the gift but the receiver must also be ready to receive it god is prepared to give but you must have the capacity to receive through your surrender and spiritual efforts you become ready to receive god's grace therefore to enter into the kingdom of liberation you must have god's love and you must have the merit of your own spiritual efforts 
when these two come together you will be able to gain liberation so what is the real wealth the gita taught that if you want to enter the kingdom of liberation there are 26 noble qualities that you should acquire 26 but truly it is enough if you have gained just one virtuous quality that will be sufficient to qualify you for entire for entry of all of the virtuous qualities given in the gita chapter on devotion one of the most important is contentment contentment tripti only the one who has contentment can be considered great who is the greatest human being in this world the answer is the one who is always satisfied therefore develop this contentment in yourself do not get lost in the world aspiring for impermanent joys impermanent wealth impermanent position and luxuries there is no objection to your enjoying the happiness which comes your way but never forget the world is made up of only of the five elements it has no eternal value your body also consists only of the five elements as long as you consider this world real you will tend to have attachments to the body and to a given place it is best if you do not waste your time caught up with these attachments instead always remember the goal the example is given there was a wealthy man who had traveled the world over he resolved to build a palatial mansion without equal anywhere it was to be a house of such extraordinary grandeur that it would be beyond the imagination of anyone he resolved to construct this unique structure even if it cost him tens of millions of dollars so a number of engineers and architects were called upon from various countries for this purpose ultimately he completed his beautiful mansion and he now had a house which satisfied people from all points of view and different cultural backgrounds tens of thousands of people came to look at it this wealthy man made all the arrangements for a grand inauguration of this unique place before the inauguration he called a number of experts and asked them do you find any defects any faults in this building anywhere even in the smallest detail they could find none it seemed to be perfect he invited all kinds of people to the function including many wealthy citizens and high officials he also invited great sages to gain their blessings among the invited guests there were a number of truly wise men all elaborate arrangements were made for their stay after they were assembled he prayed to them i humbly ask you to let me know if there are any defects any shortcomings in this structure the engineers who had constructed the building echoed his sentiments and also asked the assembled crowd who can come forward and just point out a single flaw in this beautiful building we feel that it is absolutely flawless and magnificent it is totally unique and modern perfect in every detail at this point a yogi who was standing in the corner stepped out and addressed the wealthy man who was hosting the affair the yogi said esteemed sir i see two major flaws in this building all the people assembled there were greatly surprised the engineers and architects were shocked everyone was most curious to know 
what these defects were. The wealthy man whose house it was folded his hands in supplication and said to the great sage, O oh Swami, please tell me what those defects are that you have spotted. Everyone is anxiously awaiting your answer. The yogi said, O oh rich man, these are faults for which you are not to blame. Not even engineers or architects or workmen. These defects are not within your reach or anyone else's to correct. One defect is that with the passage of time this building and everything that is now standing here will fall down and be reduced to rubble. This is a defect that cannot be changed. The second failing is that the person who built this structure will also perish and be forgotten. This too cannot be changed. Even though these conclusions may be delayed for a short period of time, they will both come to pass. Not realizing this truth, you think that you have accomplished something flawless and great, that your, achi that your achievement will be permanent, but it is not so. These defects that I have mentioned will always prevail in the end. Such is the state of affairs for people who forget death and think that they or their works or reputation will be permanent. Only when you keep your focus on the Atman will you be filled with contentment and feel unending joy and bliss. When you have such everlasting peace and contentment, you will be established in a mansion that can never perish. For then you are abiding in the Atman, your unchanging permanent self. It alone has lasting value. There is nothing that can be compared with that dwelling place. Unlike the mansions you find in the world, it is perfect and permanent, free from all defects. Therefore, you have to recognize the truth that in this mundane world everything is impermanent. Keep your sight and concentration on the permanent Atman. Constantly engage yourself in spiritual practice in order to achieve this inner vision and remain ever contented, undisturbed by worldly affairs. So, focusing on the Divine Supreme. Surrendering yourself totally, dedicating yourself, maintaining your purity level, you will be able to recognize God's grace and you will immediately come to know Finally, God has, bestowed, God has bestowed His grace upon you. That's the way we should live upon in this world. Not simply waste the time in uh, engaging ourselves in useless activities. How much time we are wasting in uh, Activity is not useful to us, or to us or our life. So let us try to make use of the time, practice spirituality with all sincerity and devotion. And that is the way to win God's grace. Thank you. Om Sahana Vavato Sahana Bhunakto Sahaviryam karavavahai Tejasvi navadhi tamastoma vidvishavahai Om shanti 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 Harihi Om May the Divine Spirit protect us, guide us, give us strength and right understanding.
may we not hate one another may love and harmony be with us all peace 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 be unto all may the divine lord protect us may he nourish us may we work in harmony with great vigor may our study be illuminating and fruitful may we not hate each other peace 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 be unto all